People, listen up. We have a dangerous dog problem. And no, I don't mean that packs of dangerous dogs are roaming our streets or that even dog bites are a serious problem in the country. They aren't and there aren't. No, the problem we have with dangerous dogs is the way that we talk about them and deal with them often gets most everything wrong and that causes all kinds of other problems. Stick with me and I will explain. Myra Gulch, the human personification of the Wicked Witch of the West. In the iconic film The Wizard of Oz, one of the ways that she expresses her wick wickedness is by seeking to destroy Toto the dog. Though it's clear that Toto bit Gulch, there's more going on in the story. Auntie M delivers the final message from this scene when she says, He's really gentle, with gentle people that is. It's ironic that this movie from 1939 expresses a view of dog bites that is maybe better informed than dog bite policies at many animal shelters today. But before I get into that, I want to start by talking a little about what many animal advocates get wrong about dangerous dogs. Because I've met many animal lovers who honestly believe in their heart of hearts that there are no bad dogs but it's simply not true. There are dogs who are willing to use their teeth when unprovoked in order to inflict significant and serious bodily harm and that are beyond the reach of anything known to veterinary medicine or behavioral science. Don't believe me? Check out this video. I could show you more like it, including some really gory ones, Sometimes a dog's aggressive behavior is so complex it can't even be put into a nice little box. And furthermore, it's worth pointing out that every year about 30 people in the U.S. are killed by dogs. Obviously, relative to the number of people and animals there are, this is a tiny number, but it's not zero. And if you add in the serious dog attacks that are not fatal, the number's bigger. And unfortunately, sanctuary is not really an option for the vast majority of dangerous dogs. I mean, have you ever tried placing an actually dangerous dog in a sanctuary? I have. The reputable ones won't take them. Another thing animal advocates often get wrong is assuming that dogs that look friendly or nice in their online pictures and videos can't be dangerous because they look so nice. They assume dangerous dogs are constantly in some sort of agitated state, which is far from the truth. In fact, most of the serious dangerous dogs are really dangerous due to their unpredictability. They may be perfectly fine for extended periods of time, but when they're bad, they're very, very bad. For these reasons, it's important that we begin any conversation about dangerous dogs by acknowledging that dangerous dogs are a true public safety concern and that animal shelters have a responsibility to keep the public safe and to keep dangerous dogs out of the public sphere. But the way animal shelters have historically tried to do this has also been really a problem because they have failed to solve dangerous dog problems while also killing scores of innocent dogs and tearing apart families whose pets get wrongly and arbitrarily labeled as dangerous. In fact, a recent study by veterinary behaviorist Dr. Jessica Heckman which set out to test the methods most animal shelters use to identify dangerous dogs, found that in many cases, they were no better at predicting aggressive behavior than flipping a coin. I mean, think about that. Many animal shelters routinely use methods to determine who lives or dies that are no better than a coin toss. 
How would you like the fate of one of your four-legged family members to be decided by something as random and arbitrary as the flipping of a coin? This test that you're watching, for example, is used by many animal shelters and is supposed to determine a dog's compatibility with children. In it, a tester stomps a large plastic doll in front of a dog to see how it responds, as if any dog would actually believe the plastic doll is an actual child. The dog in this video failed the test, though no matter how many times I watch it, I can't for the life of me imagine why. This is just one part of one of the evaluation methods Dr. Heckman criticized when she wrote, quote, These are pretty chilling results. They could be interpreted to mean that the two most widely used behavioral assessments in the United States are not doing even a passable job of predicting aggression, and that shelters are not doing much more than flipping a coin when they use an assessment to decide whether a dog will be put on the adoption floor or potentially euthanized, end quote. The other thing that animal shelters do that needlessly kills dogs is what I like to think of as the Elmira Gulch approach. Dogs a menace to the community. I'm taking him to the sheriff and make sure he's destroyed. That's what I call it when animal shelters automatically destroy dogs that have any history of biting. I call it that because even the writers of The Wizard of Oz back in 1939 understood that sometimes dogs have good reason to bite. And after all, Biting is a perfectly normal and natural behavior for dogs that have teeth, and they use those teeth for all kinds of things. Dogs play using their teeth, they communicate using their teeth, and they defend themselves with their teeth. And of course, sometimes they're aggressive. Understanding the differences is important because nearly all dogs will bite in the right situation, and most dogs will bite somebody at some point in their lives. While dog bites are relatively common, injuries from dog bites are not. According to the Center for Disease Control, or CDC, 98% of dog bites require no medical attention at all. This pie chart represents the total number of dog bites in the USA each year. This little sliver over here is the 1.7% of dog bites where people seek medical attention. And keep in mind that many people believe that any dog bite requires medical attention. Some of the bites in this little sliver are very serious bites or attacks, but some of them are also pretty minor. To find the fatal dog attacks on this chart, we have to zoom way in to see this single thin line that represents one third of 1% of total dog bites. Said another way, there are more than 70 million dogs living in the United States, yet your chances of being killed by one are about as close to zero without actually being zero as you can get. So to put dog attacks into perspective, you are 173 times more likely to be killed by your work than you are by a dog. You are 1,000 times more likely to be shot to death you are 1,344 times more likely to die in a car accident. You are even more likely to be struck and killed by lightning than you are to be killed by a dog. The CDC dog bite data also tells us that in the vast majority of cases, human behavior is the primary cause of dogs biting which is actually great news because it means that by teaching people how to interact with dogs responsibly, we can reduce dog bites. And culturally, we all know that very well. That's where sayings like, let sleeping dogs lie comes from. For all these reasons, when animal shelters follow the Elmira Gulch approach, they end up killing a lot of pets who've never really harmed anyone and who that almost certainly won't. 
But the problem with this approach is much worse than that even, because it also fails to address the issues that surround actual seriously dangerous dogs, which is particularly troubling because the factors that come together to create the most seriously dangerous dogs are pretty well known and documented. Guess what? There are six common factors that link nearly all fatal dog attacks, as reported by the Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association. Though not every attack includes all six, the overwhelming vast majority of them include multiples of these factors. Factor number one, there was no able-bodied person to intervene. This usually involves an attack on a young child or a senior person incapable of handling the dog. This is a factor in 87.1% of the cases. Factor number two, the victim had no prior relationship with the dog, a factor in 85.2% of the cases. Number three, the dog was not neutered or spayed with male intact animals being the most likely, likely perpetrators of serious attacks, true in 84.4% of cases. Number four, the victim, due to age or physical or mental status, was incapable of even managing an interaction with dogs, true in 77.4% of cases. Number five, the dog is a resident dog and not a family pet. These dogs are usually chained outside with little or no positive social interaction. I could go on for an hour about why chaining dogs outside is a terrible thing and represents a form of neglect and abuse. Suffice it to say that keeping dogs this way can cause behavioral and psychological damage that's difficult or impossible to correct. This was a factor in 76.2% of cases. Number six, the owner had a history of abusing or neglecting the dog, true in 58.6% of the cases. And I would argue it's likely true more than that because we can't always know the history of a dog that's been neglected or abused. And I would also argue that because of item number five, keeping dogs chained outdoors is itself a form of neglect and abuse. That tells me that at, at 58.6%, this factor is being significantly undercounted. The same report also clearly stated that dog breed is not a factor in predicting serious or fatal dog attacks, which is not surprising to people who actually know dogs. But unfortunately, we have a history of marginalizing and stereotyping dogs based on their appearance, and when we do that, we nearly always get it wrong. We have a history of trying to brand certain breeds of dogs as inherently dangerous, but ironically, the breeds that we do that to changes over time. For a while, it was Doberman Pinschers. Then it was Rottweilers. German Shepherds were branded dangerous for a while too. Today, it's the so-called Pitbull that gets the bum rap, which is particularly annoying to me because Pitbull is not even a breed of dog. Okay, sure, the United Kennel Club, or UKC, does recognize a breed called the American Pit Bull Terrier. But when animal shelters use the term pit bull, they're not even referring to UKC registered American Pit Bull Terriers. What they call pit bulls are oftentimes American Staffordshire Terriers, or up to a dozen other breeds of dogs, including Staffordshire Bull Terriers, Bull Terriers, American Bulldogs, and many other breeds. In other words, Pit Bull is therefore not a breed. It's a description of a dog based on appearance alone. Any dog that has a short coat and a blocky head is likely to be called a Pit Bull. In many animal shelters, Boxer cattle dog mixes are likely to be labeled as pit bulls when they clearly are not. And scores of ridiculously false urban legends about so-called pit bulls, which again isn't even a breed of dog, fuels hysteria about dogs that fit the description. People say they have locking mechanisms in their jaws, but no dog actually does. People say they have the most powerful jaws and the strongest bite strength, 
My money would be on the larger breed dogs like Mastiffs. So you can't tell if a dog is dangerous based on its breed, and you may as well use a Ouija board as one of the so-called temperament test shelters use to predict dog behavior, but that doesn't mean all hope is lost trying to identify dangerous dogs. Two different aspects of dog behavior can be evaluated pretty objectively. Bite inhibition and bite restraint. These are characteristics of dog behavior that allow them to live in complex social groups. Without them, dogs might be prone to dangerously biting each other and their family structures would fall apart pretty quickly. A dog with a lot of bite inhibition is one that generally refrains from biting until it feels it has no other option. Dogs with a lot of it are less likely to bite. It's that simple. Bite restraint is the amount of control a dog uses when it does bite, because not all bites apply full pressure. Most dogs have a good amount of bite inhibition and bite restraint, which is why, relative to the number of dogs, there are relatively few bites and why most dog bites require no medical attention when they do happen. Dogs with little bite inhibition and a lot of bite restraint can seem vicious when in fact they really aren't, like the following video demonstrates. Hi everybody, it's Paul. You know, a lot of people ask me, uh, after a long day of voiceover or writing or doing all those creative things that I do, um, how do I relax? Well, like many other Americans, uh, I come home and I, I pet my dog. You see, petting the dog is one of the most relaxing things you can possibly do. It releases a hormone called oxytocin, which reduces stress. Also, it lowers your heart rate and it lowers your blood pressure. Plus, people who pet their dogs are five times more likely to live longer than people who just have cats. Plus, the dogs like it so much, and it's a nice bonding experience. That's right. Good daddy, little boy. Dogs that are truly dangerous are those with little or no bite inhibition and little or no bite restraint. These are dogs that will use their teeth to inflict serious bodily harm even when not provoked into doing so. Both bite inhibition and bite restraint are developed as puppies during normal puppy social interactions with their canine family members. Veterinary behaviorists say that dogs develop all of the bite restraint and inhibition that they're going to by the time they're four to five months of age. So a dog that has little or of either that is older than five months of age and that's large enough to inflict bodily harm is a dangerous dog. Technically, they're mentally unhealthy and have a grave prognosis for recovery. In animal sheltering, they are unhealthy, unmanageable, and untreatable. And unless humane sanctuary is available, again, it almost never is, humane euthanasia is the only viable option. But this is a tiny percentage of the dogs that enter animal shelters, which is why successful no-kill shelters achieve save rates of 95% and higher. Successful no-kill animal shelters have thoughtful policies surrounding dog bites and don't punish dogs that bite because people did stupid things. By doing this, they can help people learn to interact with dogs more responsibly, and they're able to focus their attention on dealing with dogs that are actually dangerous. As a result, serious dog bites often decline when animal control goes no-kill, and they usually drop pretty quickly. Austin, Texas is a great example. After achieving no-kill, dog bites classified as moderate to severe declined by 13%, while dog bites classified as severe fell by 89%. The bottom line is that we cannot keep people safe from dangerous dogs by punishing dogs for stupid human behaviors. Shelters need thoughtful and comprehensive policies and practices surrounding dog behavior, or they're failing their pets and their citizens. No-Kill Learning has published a document titled Dangerous Dog Policy Recommendations for Animal Shelters that's available for download from our website 
at nokilllearning.com. Check it out. If you need help rethinking your dangerous dog policies, practices, and protocols, I'm here to help, and my contact information is at the link.